Okay, let's go to our Bibles and go to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses um, 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, uh, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. We want to look at uh, the trial of our faith tonight. Gloria mentioned the, the difficulties at home, and that's one kind of trial. We have a lot of other kinds of trials. A little warm in here? Uh, not all trials are bad. I, I remember being in a, a health class in, when I was in college, um, one time when I was in college, <laughs> way, way back, and uh, they talked a little bit about stress. And when we think of stress, usually we think of something that's, that's bad that's happening to us and we get under stress. But really, anything that, any kind of change in our lives uh, can be stressful, even if it's a good change. And so, even though Peter is mainly talking about uh, some sort of a, a trial or, or difficulty that people are going through, we have other kinds of difficulties that aren't really bad, but it does sometimes shake us up. And we still, no matter what, need to have faith to go through any kind of difficulty. So what we want to look at tonight is is having an attitude toward God that uh, to recognize that we will be growing through the discipline uh, that he brings in our lives, and I and I the discipline. When I talk about that, I'm not talking about spanking or anything like that. If I were going to talk about God um, bringing trials to our life, uh, I would call it chastening. I wouldn't call it discipline because discipline is learning and growing in in the right way. Okay, so God does discipline us, but that's a constant thing. He's not always chastening us. When we are bad, when we've done wrong, and we go the wrong way, that's when He brings a trial to chasten us. But many times He brings a trial just to help us grow. And that's what we want to uh, focus on uh, tonight. Remember what James says. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So, when you think of trying of your faith, what James says, trying of your faith, and what Peter says, the trial of your faith, actually trying and trial are the same exact Hebrew word, or G Greek word. And it, it simply means a trial, or a, um, we've talked about it before, a testing, a proving. One of the songs we, we sang was um, trusting in Jesus. And it says, uh, how I trust him, how I proved him, over, or and or, over and over. Uh, we, we prove Jesus, we prove God uh, 
daily if we are watching and recognizing that He brings the difficulties to us. And He brings the difficulty to help us to grow. Go over to um, Hebrews chapter 5. And this isn't talking about trials, but what the writer to the Hebrews says gives us an indication of what what God is doing when He brings difficulties, brings trials. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 14. Now the the writer was saying uh, in verse 12, you should be teachers by now, but you're still babies. They haven't learned and they haven't grown. And so he says in verse 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What's he saying? He's saying that as they as they grow and put into practice the things they learn from God, they learn the difference between good and evil. And sometimes people don't see good or evil in situations. People don't recognize it. The world, what does it say in the, in the Scripture, in the Old Testament, it says people are going to call good evil and evil good. You see that today. It is disgusting what you see and hear in the world today. Because they do not, it, it, it's, not a, <laughs> it's, it's not that they haven't known, I believe they have chosen not to know. Because I can go back to, I don't go back there, but when you look back in the, uh, in the book of Genesis and you see what Adam and Eve uh, partook of what they, when they disobeyed God, what tree did they eat from? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so every person has the ability to know what is the difference between good and evil. But many people, those people who don't know Christ, don't even care. And that's where this, what uh, the writer is saying to the Hebrews, uh, there are people, even Christians, who choose not to get to know the difference. He says the, the people, though, who, are, who can eat stronger meat, understand more uh, maybe difficult places in Scripture that God teaches, they can do that because they have learned the basics. They have put to use their knowledge of good and evil. And notice it uses the word exercise. It's a good word because that's we see that in the physical realm. When we exercise our bodies, <laughs> two things can happen. We can die of a heart attack or we can ex- grow stronger muscles, right? So if you do it right, you're going to grow stronger muscles. And it's little by little. Uh, when God makes a Christian, he's not fully grown. He's not mature. He needs to grow just like a physical baby grows. And uh, so we need to grow in these exercises of faith. These times of trials, tribulation, times of exercising that God puts us through. And and, uh, Peter talks about uh, salvation. He talks about what... uh, um, uh, we call the hope of salvation. Look at uh, verse number back in First Peter uh, one. He says, "To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation." ready to be revealed at the last time. Go over to Titus. Hang on to this. We're coming back. Go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 and verse number 13. He says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope. What is that hope? That hope 
of salvation. And again, that hope is, is a matter of faith. God has promised that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. We call it, the Bible calls it salvation. But he says a hope of salvation. And what he's saying is not that um, I hope I'm saved. The hope of salvation is that future that he's looking at. And he says there, um, let's turn past, uh, for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So we're looking for the appearing. We're looking for that, that um, rapture when Christ comes in the clouds and we are drawn up and are caught up together in the clouds. And that is the culmination of our, I'd say, process that we're living through right now. We are saved. We have eternal life. But it's, it hasn't come to the end. I'm thinking of if, if you were running, if we're all running a race, we're all in the race, but we haven't come to the end of the race yet. Yes, we're in the race. We are. We have eternal life, but we haven't come to that end of this this time period where God stops working in the church and in people's lives. It's the beginning then, at that time, the end of this section and then the beginning of eternity with God. And this is what he's saying, that blessed hope. And Peter... Back in 1 Peter, look what he says. Oh, I'm sorry, not 1 Peter. Go, go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Look at verse number 9. He says, But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Okay, what, what's he saying? He's saying God uh, sent Jesus Christ, um, uh, became lower than the angels. He became a man so that he could die for the suffering of death. And then he says that he should taste death for every man. Not just taste it, but experience death instead of us. Okay, now let's look at verse 10. For it became him. What does became mean? That's a hard one. I, I always get mixed up. I know what it means, but it's hard to define. It means it, it, he looks good in it. Okay? It became him. It was the right thing. It was a good thing. It became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bring, bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Wait a minute. Who is the captain of our salvation? Who? Jesus Christ. Okay. You know what captain means? You know, it, it, he doesn't have a, doesn't, not wearing a cap, doesn't have bars on his shoulders. Uh, it, it means the, when we see the author of salvation, it's the author, he is the creator of this salvation. He is the one who established it. Okay. So uh, he says, to make the captain of their salvation, Christ, perfect. Oh, but wait a minute. Ooh, okay, now we got another problem. Isn't Jesus Christ already perfect? How can he be made perfect? Now, it's a picture. It's a picture of what he has done for us and how he came to that point to die on the cross. He said, through sufferings. So Christ finished the work. That's what the word perfect means, complete. He, his, his work of, of living for us uh, his work for, of, of obeying the law and His work of dying for us was finished. Remember what He said on the cross? Probably the last thing He said on the cross. It is finished. And uh, that's what He has done. So he, he did all of that for us. And uh, Peter calls it an inheritance incorruptible what we have to look forward to this body our bodies now when they die they there's not, nothing keeping them alive so what's going to happen it's going to decompose but 
we're going to have an inheritance in heaven that is not corruptible, will not decompose. So Peter, I'm sorry, Jesus went through uh, trials, went through uh, sufferings on earth. And Peter points out that even the trials and the sufferings that we might go through, the trial of our faith, he says it reach, uh, it, it works for um, praise and honor and glory. Look at verse 6. Verses 6 and 7. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, through, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This is one of those sentences where you got to take out some of, the, some of the guts of the sentence and put one the first part with the last part so you see the, the basic meaning and then throw in the other things, kind of descriptive. So he says that the trial of your faith might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So you'll praise the Lord that you've had this, these trials, these tribulations in the world, unto the praise and honor and glory at the coming of Christ. It's over. When He returns, all our sufferings are over. All of our trials, all of our difficulties is over, are over. When we put our Faith in Christ. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about daily living. When a trial comes, as we are living by faith in Jesus Christ, He gives us the strength to go through the trial. He gives and We can't depend on ourselves. In that verse 6, when He says, wherein, He says, wherein, you greatly rejoice. Well, what is it that you're in that you great, greatly rejoice about? Your salvation. The salvation you have that God has given you, in that you rejoice. Even though you have some difficulties on this, uh, in this world. Go over to Hebrews chapter 11. Remember, I said we, we are in this race of sorts. We are in this life now. We have eternal life. We have our salvation. But when it says we look forward to that blessed hope, there's something different that he's looking at. It's not about salvation alone. It's not even about eternal life overall. Because right now, you and I, if we put our, put our faith in Jesus Christ, we now have eternal life even though this body's going to die. You get what I'm saying? We have eternal life. If, if we don't have eternal life, or if we can lose our salvation, it wouldn't be eternal. So we have it now. But what we look forward to is instead of living this salvation by faith, we will live that salvation by sight and by experience. And this passage in Hebrews 11 kind of gives us a, a little bit of picture about that because he's talking about the people of the Old Testament who lived by faith. All right, look at Hebrews chapter 11, two verses. Look at verse number 13, first of all. He says, he gave a bunch of uh, names and talked a little bit about them. So he said, these all died in faith, not having received the promises. Okay, they didn't experience Jesus Christ. They didn't see Jesus Christ die on the cross. They didn't see Jesus Christ live on the earth. But they experience. They they uh, they haven't received the promises. But then look at this. But having seen them afar off, how did they see them afar off? Some people might say, "Well, God, this prophecy that God gave to them." Uh, no, it's by faith. Remember, faith. I think it's in the next. Uh, no, it's right there, verse number one. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it's evidence that they saw by faith. They lived their lives by faith, and they looked ahead, and they believed it. They recognized it. They did not have a personal experience in it, though. 
Okay, so he says, uh, we're persuaded of them and embrace them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims. Now look down at verse 39. And these all, same people or more people, he added, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Okay, now they didn't at that time. But when Christ returns, they will receive that promise. Okay, so that's what we're looking, looking at. We experience it by faith, but looking down through the years, someday we're going to experience it for real, physically. Whether, whether we will be changed from this body or we will have died and we'll have a new body. But it's something that we look forward to and it's that hope that we have. Go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 24. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? You don't have to have faith in something that you can see. Here's my phone. Do you believe I have a phone? If you don't, you've got a problem. But if you... Uh, here's the here's the phone right here. You see it. If I didn't hold that up, you could you could believe it, but you're not sure about it if you hadn't seen it. So, what do we hope for? We can hope for something that we haven't seen. But once we see it, there's no reason to hope for it. It's there. It's actually real. Look at verse 25. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? So now we're waiting. And he says, with patience. Now remember what James said? The trying of your faith worketh patience. And so we are to have patience. And it's not a patience like, okay, hurry up, God. It's just, this is my life. This is the way I live. And I'm living for the Lord. And I continue in faith, uh, recognizing that the things that come in my life just help me grow stronger for the Lord. Peter had a, a, a trial. Let's go real quickly. I got two minutes, okay? Real quickly, go back to Luke chapter 22. Peter, we know, had a, a trial, and we might think it's a trial of faith. We might think that he lost his faith at one point. But I want us to understand it, it's not a losing faith or it's not a uh, it's not a failing of his faith. Luke chapter 22, verse number. I'm talking about this isn't this passage isn't it, but I'm talking about when Jesus denied Christ. Okay, Jesus sat or Peter sat by that fire and he denied him three times. Okay, but look what what uh, Peter says and look what Jesus says. Verse number 31. Luke 22, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for, you, for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said, now this is Peter, said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Well, that's a pretty strong words, isn't it? We, we see that, and it's so uh, 2,000 years ago that Peter did this, and today we're still looking at it and, and thinking, how could he do that? How could he say that? Uh, but that's what he said. I'm ready to die with you. Well, later that evening, what happened? He got a little bit afraid, didn't he? And uh, it seems like that's what it was. I don't know the man. He denied Jesus Christ. Now, did his faith fail? Ah, think about it. I just read something that you should you should see there and say, oh no, his faith didn't fail. What am I saying? Jesus said he prayed for him. Jesus prayed for him that his faith fail not. So if Jesus prays for him, was his prayer not answered if Peter's faith failed? 
Now, wait a minute. We're talking about Jesus praying, right? Did Jesus pray in faith? Absolute faith. Perfect faith. When he prays, it's coming to pass. Okay? It's not like my prayers. <laughs> okay? I don't know if I'm talking... When I pray, I don't know if it's God's will or not in some cases. P Jesus always knew. So when he said, I prayed for you, Peter, that your faith doesn't fail. That night, Peter denied Jesus Christ. But his faith did not fail. What he was doing, and this is where we'll look at next time. What was happening was he was depending on himself. And when we depend on ourselves, the trials that come beat us down. And we can't handle them. Peter couldn't handle it. All they were doing was asking him, Oh, you were saying you were with him. No, I wasn't. No. All I can figure is he was afraid they were gonna take him up there and crucify him too. But no, Peter depended on himself. He says, I'm ready to go to die with you. Peter, you're gonna deny me. No. Was he boasting? I don't think he was boasting. I think he really believed it. But when it came down to it, he had problems. And we do that too. Like I said, we'll if we're if we're resting in ourselves, we will fail. But not necessarily our faith because you still believe certain situations pull us down because we're in our thinking about ourselves. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your strength. Thank you for the ability that we can have our faith in you and be strong in our faith. Lord, help us to see the difficulties of life and recognize that we can go through them with your strength, not going through with our own strength knowing that you are the one who is taking care of the battles. Lord, help us to stand strong depending on you. Guide us now as we go to prayer. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.